Um, welcome to the Reimagining uh, India panel. I'm Tanvi Madan. I'm a, uh, the director of the India Project at Brookings in Washington, as well as a fellow in the Foreign Policy Program. Um, the panel that we're just, uh, w the panel theme is Reimagining India. And if you look back, and we're not going to do too much of that in the panel discussion itself, um, but it's been 25 years uh, since India's landmark economic reforms and about 2.5 years uh, since Prime Minister Modi took office um, with a, a majority, a parliamentary majority that no Indian Prime Minister uh, had had for about 25 years. Um, so where we're going to look at the, in the panel is where things stand today. There was a lot of hope and expectation when the Prime Minister came to office in 2014, um, and uh, where things stand today and where they're headed uh, from here on out. Uh, we're going to look mostly internally focused, so it's of course connected to what India is doing internationally, because we've got a panel coming up after uh, on India's uh, international engagements. Uh, and for this panel, we have a great set of panelists. There's Meher Sharma, columnist for Business Standard and Bloomberg View. Uh, his 2015 book, which is available outside, I think, is called Restart, uh, The Last Chance for the Indian Economy. If you were uh, here yesterday, you know that um, here is the optimist on the panel. Uh, Gunjan uh, Bagla, who is founder and managing director of Amrit Ventures, uh, and author of the book Doing Business in 21st Century India. Uh, and we've also got Dr. Rafiq Dosani, who is... Uh, the local representative on the panel and director of the RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy uh, and was previously director of Stanford University's Center for South Asia. The details of their bios, of course, uh, in the booklet. Um, so, Gunjan, uh, I'm going to start with you. Um, given kind of what the hope and expectations were two and a half years later, but also as you see it in kind of the broad swath of the last decade or so, from a private sector perspective, are you bullish or bearish on India? Uh, I've never been more bullish on India than I am today. And I think uh, if you look at the next 10 years, what, where you will see India stand out is, the, is going to be the result of its entrepreneurs fighting in an open market, unlike China, I might say. China's billionaires have been, became billionaires in a protected market. Uh, Mukesh Ambani was not protected. Uh, you know, neither were most of, most of India's richest people today. Uh, you are going to see a revolution caused by uh, smartphones uh, riding on top of uh, 4G. Uh, that's going to affect a billion people over the next 10 years. And uh, entrepreneurs will build their companies on top of all of this. So far, India's wealthiest people are really old economy. Right? They're, they've built their wealth on power stations and petrochemicals and so on. The next generation of entrepreneurs will build their companies on the new economy, and they will be global companies. So I'm very, very bullish. Rafiq, do you share um, Gunjan's optimism, or do you have a different perspective on uh, on where Indi the Indian economy, but also kind of um, society, stands today? And is it is it um, are we going to see ten years? Um, are you optimistic about the next ten years or not? The thing about India is that uh, it's a large, diverse country, so almost everything that you can about it is true, as much as what you can say about it on the other side is also true. Um, so in, you know, in what Gunjan said is undoubtedly true, a country with immense entrepreneurial skills, uh, particularly in technology, a strong base that's been demonstrated in the IT business in particular. So all that is true. And then on the other side, you have the reality that for the poor, in the basic services like water supply, roads, sanitation, are in miserable condition. Even in the last year, over 100,000 people died just from preventable waterborne diseases. That's 100,000 children, excuse me, died. The number of adults dying was 3,000 plus a day. You know, so we're talking of a huge problem where the poor are concerned. And, and the question is whether this so yin and yang, to use a Chinese term, I guess, uh, can lead to the, a good outcome at the end. I think it's still something that needs a lot of work. Mihir, you pointed out, I mean, you talked about some of the issues in terms of uh, related to the social infrastructure question, but you particularly talked about the demographic 
what um, uh, Indian um, policymakers will often call, or leaders these days will call the demographic dividend, and you kind of turned that on its head and said it could be a demographic disaster potentially. Um, given especially what Rafiq said about the social infrastructure issues, um, where do you see, in terms of this, how do, you, how do Indian leaders turn this demo, what could be a demographic disaster, into a demographic dividend? I think that, <clears throat> well, I think that uh, there are a couple of things that they need to start thinking about much harder. Um, you know, if you, there has finally been something of a focus on manufacturing in the central government. We've allowed our manufacturing sector to decay over 20 years, um, and we are now trying to right that. Um, but it's very difficult to create a productive workforce when so many of your uh, people are essentially underskilled, uh, underschooled, um, have access to poor health, all right, or poor health care. And you, you, an uneducated and unhealthy workforce can't build a 21st century uh, economy, right? Um, unfortunately, our emphasis on health care ha continues to be uh, um, absent. And um, so you have, you know, you still have malaria, which constantly causes people to lose work, et cetera, et cetera. And on the skill side, while there has continued to be, you know, something of a push on it, you simply don't, haven't brought the private sector on board. And I, I'm not blaming the government. I think the private sector has, uh, has also failed in this. But the collaboration between the private sector and the government in creating the skills that the private sector itself needs um, has been very slow. So you have this sort of absurd uh, sign of a labor surplus country where employers will actually tell you, we can't find people that we need. And it's like, you, you could, you have to invest six months to a year in them, even the government might even pay, but you have to work on the curriculum together. This kind of cooperation is absent. And um, I think that really needs to be pushed and it's not being done at the moment. Um, uh, Gunjan, you You've written a book on doing business in India. One of the things Prime Minister um, Modi has been trying to do, and previous governments as well, but he's, he's been quite active in terms of a campaign, is trying to attract um, foreign capital into India. Um, and one of the things that's related to, the, to, to what Rafiq and Mirav were talking about, was, which is, by some estimates, India needs to create about a million jobs a month. Um, and you need investment for that. Um, do you think Prime Minister Modi has not just in terms of his rhetoric, but in reality has, what are the things he has done in your mind that is actu have actually changed um, uh, the view of India? But what is left to be done as well? Yeah, so I think the main thing that Prime Minister Modi has accomplished in the last two years is, has to do with marketing. And I mean that in a good way. Okay, to, to create the brand that India is an attractive place to create a brand that India has influence all over the world. And I'll turn to something that doesn't seem to be related to business at all for a moment. You know, the idea of promoting uh, International Yoga Day, for example. You know, uh, what, what is the hardest thing for a brand marketer to do is how to change people's minds, right? And the easiest way to make that happen is to find something that is popular and attach yourself to it. So rather than focus on uh, on foreign direct investment and, and the mechanics of it, uh, the government chose to promote the idea that yoga came out of India, and nobody can really oppose that. And all of a sudden, there's a global movement that recognizes International Yoga Day, and along with that is the bra brand India t tends to, to move forward. Okay. Now, Mr. Modi has made a number of trips to the United States. Uh, his most recent trip probably had some business-related success. The first two trips, I would say, were really directed at those 500 million angry young men of India mm -hmm. because he wanted to show that Mark Zuckerberg wants to talk to Narendra Modi. The timing of that town hall was right for Indian prime time, not for America. Okay? So he, these things have not been accidents. Uh, he's been very, very focused on building the brand and the marketing, and then all of the other things will follow. American companies, when they see an opportunity in India, are going to come and invest there. Uh, it's not, India has opened for 100% foreign direct investment in almost every sector, including defense as of last week. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, you're going to see an increasing amount of overseas money coming into India. But I've always maintained that India does not need 
foreign direct investment as much as many other countries do because of its vibrant local capital markets where even foreign companies raise money in India to grow. Uh, Mayor, on this, we haven't seen the private sector uh, investing, in, in the Indian private sector investing uh, as much. There have been complaints of various thoughts, but for good reasons and bad. Um, but going back to this point, and Rafiq and Mihir, both your thoughts on this. I mean, we've seen this phase in terms of the marketing, the kind of brand India campaign. We saw this between 2002, and 2003, right through about 2010. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's landmark visit where for the state dinner in... Uh, uh, and at that time, India was really on a, a, on a high and being perceived. And then we saw years of disillusion been setting in. Does India have a credibility problem in terms of we, our, our company is going to wait and see whether India and Prime Minister Modi actually delivers? Uh, or is this actually going to be something that they're willing to take a chance on because the opportunity is so large? Um. I think if you've been burned once, you can go in again. If you've been burned twice, you wait. And I think a lot of uh, people who invested in India were burned twice. Burned once in 2008 and, and then again in the 2012, 2013 period. Um, and if you haven't seen uh, the returns come out of India that you expected, uh, you're going to wait. Uh, you're gonna wait to see uh, if there are changes on the ground that suggests the government is friendlier towards the idea of foreign investment than it has been previously. And it's very important to understand that the government is not the prime minister. Uh, the Indian state e exists beyond the, uh, prime, what Prime Minister Modi says. Even Prime Minister Modi's own actions may not be in keeping with what he has um, claimed that he is doing for foreign investment. Under, under this government, for example, over the past year, um, India has unilaterally announced that it will renegotiate over 70 bilateral investment treaties. What does that mean? That means that if you are a foreign investor in India, up till now, if you lost your money thanks to arbitrary action by the government, you could take them to international arbitration, um, you know, which is uh, convenient for you. Um, under the new investment treaty, uh, uh, you would not be able to do that. You would have to go through the Indian judicial process, which, has, which means that by the time you get your money back, you'd be dead. Um, so he's done that. Uh, 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 there have been a sequence of very difficult um, tax claims made on various foreign invest investors. Uh, the Japanese, for example, are deeply disturbed. They're among our biggest investors. But... Um, the government has intervened in a uh, arbitration claim that Docomo won against Tata Sons, uh, preventing Tata Sons from taking the money that they needed to pay Docomo out of the country, although the arbitration court had said this. And, uh, so the, uh, there are a bunch of other ways in which this kind of um, uh, intervention has happened recently. Uh, they just went in and told Monsanto India that all contracts between Monsanto India which is you know, only partly owned by Monsanto, which is uh, partly Indian owned. But all contracts between Monsanto India and wholly owned Indian seed companies would have to be drafted by the government. All right? And they would cap the royalties. So again, this is a sign to foreign investors that if you put your money in, you may not get the returns that you expect that you, you would. So the actions on the ground in terms of appealing to foreign investment do not match the rhetoric. And until they do match the rhetoric, I don't think we're going to see any excitement at all. I think the Modi model when he started off was, let me try and get rid of corruption at the top. And I think that has been quite a success. And then go out to the f outside world and say, let me get foreign investment to come in. And that will show up in the growth numbers within a year or two. So there, as Mihir was also pointing out, you have to follow through at the state levels, at within the bureaucracy in Delhi, which still remains utterly corrupt. Um, you know, so once you're away from the very top, but maybe it'll filter down if one's optimistic, the corruption is rampant and rife and endemic all the way to the bottom. That compounded with Modi's inability to get good thinking in his cabinet, pretty much the prime minister's office, which is very thinly staffed, perhaps a little more thinly staffed than uh, the foreign service, uh, which itself is very thinly staffed, is, just, is not able to manage the bandwidth uh, required to 
come up with good ideas. And so what happens then is you have outcomes that are negative. So for example, you talked about one million new people coming onto the workforce every month, 12 million jobs needed a year. The actual is less than half of that. You're adding on six million people to the unemployed roles every year. Even in the IT sector, Gunjan sector, there's been a sharp deceleration. Now this is a sector where globally, there's immense growth going on. And yet you look at India's 3.2, 3.3 million IT workers, that's growing at less than 5% a year. It's about 60,000 jobs will be added this year compared with 100,000 last year, 150,000 the year before. We're talking of a serious slowdown and, you know, and the government is playing with the numbers. So that's what got the, the Reserve Bank of India governor into trouble. As you know, he, he said he didn't trust the government's numbers. And so then they went after him. Modi kept completely silent while there was this victimization going on of the Reserve Bank governor. Now, you can't do that for too long. You know, once bitten, twice bitten, third time shy. And that's what's happening. So just on that, though, and, and Gunjan, I'm going to start with you. Um, this is... As is often the case with India panels, it's gone into pessimism very quickly. Um, but yet, um, yet we've had everybody in the last, uh, you know, few years, um, for everybody from Christine Lagarde to um, Admiral Harry Harris yesterday talk about India as a bright spot. So what's the good news? And I want all of you to answer that. Um, Gunjan, I'll start with you. And then Mehir, I know this is going against type, but uh, I'll give you a little time to actually think of some good news. Um, uh, and then Rafiq as well. I'll go, I'll okay. go next. So let me let me address a couple of points that came up in uh, you know related to what Rafiq just said. So uh, you know it's correct that corruption at the very highest levels in India has been pretty much eliminated. I don't think there's been any accusation of of large scale corruption in in Modi's cabinet. But there's two other factors that uh, that are positive. One is the encouragement of competition between states in India. You know, all of these things we are talking about, job creation doesn't happen at the center. Manufacturing is not regulated by the center, right? So now you have India's 29 states competing with one another. And I'd say six or seven of them are really standing out. And it's not just Gujarat and Maharashtra as it used to be. Today it's uh, Telangana, it's Karnataka, it's Tamil Nadu, it's perhaps even Kerala. And all of these states now see themselves in competition with others to attract foreign investment. And that's a good thing. Uh, we are going to see the impact of that over the next two years as, uh, as this, uh, this approach rolls out. The second thing which we haven't mentioned at all is also a result of technology. Uh, you know, India now has a national ID card system. Okay, the so-called Aadhaar card, which was implemented by the previous government. And one thing Mr. Modi has been really good at is taking credit for everything that the previous government did. Okay, and, and that's fine because there is at least continuity maintained as a result of that. Shocking, that would never happen here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. now uh, the national ID card is not just like a social security number, it's going to be tied to direct transfer payments. So a big form of retail corruption at the local level was that money that was allocated by governments for transfer payments went into the pockets of local politicians who enriched themselves. Now. With this national ID card system, most of that money will go directly into the bank accounts, newly created bank accounts, of the people who are supposed to receive that money. So I don't say this will eliminate corruption altogether, but at the retail level, you know, the power of the local administrator, the local corporate, uh, you know, the tehsil uh, level people, that will diminish greatly because they will not have access to these large sums of money being spent in transfer payments in India. So those are two things that I think are very hard to see sitting here in Santa Monica, but are having a real impact in India. Now, in terms of optimistic things, let me address the concern that Meher brought up yesterday about the, uh, the armies of angry young men. Uh, my belief is that these angry young men are soon going to be spending a lot more time on their 4G connected smartphones, uh, watching, uh, for the most part, entertainment, Bollywood, cricket, and since we are here in Southern California, we have to recognize what else they will be watching, uh, which is produced mostly in the San Fernando Valley. You know where I'm going with this, right? Uh, India is now the second largest source of, you know, of traffic to all the porn sites, okay? Uh, young, young woman who left Southern California, Sunny Leone, who finished her porn career here in Southern California, moved to India, uh, became a big star, okay? Uh, and it is these angry young men who, who are thrilled to watch Bollywood movies and see her dancing on screen. 
Uh, I think this trend will continue. Uh, entertainment, I think, will occupy a good deal of time for these angry young men. On the other hand, the women of rural India will use these smartphones to take control of their lives. And I think the biggest place where we will see that difference is taking reproductive control. Okay. My sister-in-law is a gynecologist, and she, she mentioned that in India, most women prefer to get their contraceptives via injection rather than through an IUD or use, use of condoms. And why is that? Because they can go secretly to the doctor, get the injection, and all of a sudden, the guy thinks he's firing blanks. Okay. And uh, you know the birth rate declines. So as smartphones start to proliferate throughout rural India, and as incomes rise slowly, uh, women of India will be able to take control of this. And you will find that the population uh, disaster that has been happening in India, I don't consider it a demographic dividend. I do consider it a demographic disaster. That this will really not be controlled by the young men. It will be controlled by the young women of India. And that's going to happen very rapidly over the next five to six years. I do hope that doesn't mean the women doing all the work and the men uh, on their smartphones. I suspect... That, that's, um, that's already the case. I the women do all the work. I suspect <laughs> Mihir would argue that having young men on their smartphones is only going to increase the problem and not doing work rather than uh, the other. But Rafiq, good news. Well, um, I thought what Gunjan would say is that all these angry young men will take Etihad flights out and... That'll solve the problem if judge, judging by what we heard yesterday from the aviation guy. But you know, I think the good news about India is that this corruption at the top has come down. The question, and the other part of good news is that we now have important elections almost every year. Although India has national elections every five years, there are important state elections every year. The whole election cycle has gone completely out of wax. So instead of being harmonized, you now have every year you have six or seven important states that go to the polls. I see that as good news because it puts pressure on the government to perform. They, now, you could argue that they double down and do, you know, try and manipulate the elections. And they've tried that. It failed last year in Bihar. This year, in, you know, BJP's vote share came down in every single state that elections were held. Next year, you have Uttar Pradesh, Uttarakhand, about 350 million population will be going to vote uh, next year in local polls. That's huge. The impact of that is going to be defining for Modi's government. So it's in all practical senses a national election. This government will be under immense pressure to perform over the next year. So that's the good news. Mihir. OK, so um, I have two sort of suggested op ways to be optimistic. First, I will um, sort of disagree with something. Um, I think uh, both of you have said that uh, high-level corruption is down, and it may well be. I just caution us against assuming that we know it is. Two, two and a half years, three years into uh, the previous administration, we did not know about any large-scale corruption scandals. They were on, but we didn't know they were there. All right, nobody had investigated them yet. The outcomes hadn't become obvious yet. The decisions, the corrupt decisions had already been made. Money had already changed hands to, a, to, a, to the extent it had. But we didn't know until four or five years later. Um, and the same might be happening now. So we can't make the assumption just because they're saying they're not corrupt. This is not, this is not a safe assumption to make. Um, but I will sort of agree uh, with two things. One is what Gunjan said about uh, smartphones. And I don't think it's just um, for the women. I do think that it's, it's positive for a lot of the young men also. Because if the, uh, as I tried to sort of say yesterday, uh, I wasn't maybe clear enough about it. Um, there will be, uh, if you do not give them the opportunity uh, to get sort of good manufacturing jobs of the kind that people traditionally have, they will find their own paths to prosperity. And whether that f involves finding fund funders online, finding partners online, finding business plans online, uh, finding customers online, this is something that they are more than capable of doing. All right, and especially since this, as I said, this is a digital first generation, they will think of the smartphone not just as an entertainment object, but as a source of possible income for them. Uh, and so this is uh, something that we have to be optimistic about because we don't know what uh, young people will do when confronted with no options and no outlet to the outside world except a 4G data connection. So that's one. Uh, and the second thing is that um, 
again, sort of vaguely tech-related. The universal um, ID card uh, uh, that Rafiq mentioned, which is um, Aadhaar, as it's called, is, is uh, the first time that anyone in India will have a genuine identity. Normally, in India, you are invisible to the state. The state cannot find you, and you cannot find the state. If, you walk, if you're a poor person and you walk in demanding your rights, they'll say, who are you? We have no record of you. Prove that you're yourself. And most people do not have a passport, a driving license, any kind of documentation that can link them up uh, um, to the, the larger welfare state. This allows you to actually have a direct link between yourself and the state for the first time. What does this mean? Uh, first of all, yes, of course, it reduces low-level corruption. But it completely changes the nature of the state and of Indian politics. All right, you no longer, if you are, let's say you're, you're a policymaker sitting in a state or a national capital, you, you want to go out and find, um, you know, the uh, uh, single mothers with an income uh, below so much who have a girl child who are in a particular district. There's no way of finding them and directly targeting assistance or help to them under the previous uh, mechanisms. Now you can find these people, or at least begin to start to find these people, which means you do not need the kind of intermediaries and middlemen that are the typical way in which the state has operated to provide benefits to its people. If you don't need those intermediaries, those intermediaries no longer have political power. And politics suddenly becomes much more modern in a particular sense. It becomes between the individual and the state, rather than the sort of old feudal model in India, which is between the individual, a local tough, and the state. And this completely changes the accountability mechanisms. This makes it a, a, a far more robust democracy and a far more efficient state than we have had up till, up till, up till this moment. Rafiq, you want to show? Yeah, I wanted, just when Mihir was getting optimistic, um, I wanted to take on the issue of women, the status of women. Both of you seem to be arguing that as a result of new technologies, uh, the status of women will improve. Uh, I have doubts about that. You know, you have today, in, in India is the rape capital of the world with a rape taking place every 20 seconds of the day. Uh, you have a large number of rural women living at home and working very hard on handicrafts. At last count, about 40 million women are in rural areas work, turning out handicraft products under extremely adverse working conditions. They, they, you know, tobacco, rolling tobacco, uh, things like that. And it's not nice artisanal stuff where they're stitching stuff to high standard. It's dangerous work. And accompanying them are, are their children. And here's an example of very poor bandwidth in the, in the Modi government. They just passed a few months ago a law on child labor, raising the age for permissible child labor from 14 to 18. Sounds lovely on paper. Till you see the, the exceptions, and one exception is accepting work at home with the family. So suddenly, children who are not allowed to work, for example, on tobacco rolling, will now be allowed to do that. And this is something that the, at UNICEF has noted, Kailash Satyarthi, the uh, Nobel Prize winner noted that this law completely fails India's children and women. I'm very concerned about the status of women. I don't think technology is, is a solution. This requires serious thinking. I think we could probably have an entire panel on the fact, because, for example, you have heard the argument that one way technology and, and the media have helped is that uh, one of the reasons you're seeing a lot of discussion and hearing a lot of discussion women speaking out is that today you have higher reporting of rape and it's become much more accepted for women to speak out because the dynamic has changed and you are seeing uh, more women uh, kind of in the workplace, though as Meher argued, the problem in India has become that as, uh, as there's an ability to kind of uh, increase incomes, women are actually staying at home. So that might be a, a problem in the future. I want to move to the question of politics. Um, Ravik, you mentioned the elections in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is larger than most, has a population larger than most countries. Um, but there are a number of other state elections over the next couple of years, and then uh, another general election in 2019. Uh, and while democracy in many ways has made the reforms that have been undertaken sustainable, uh, there is also the concern that um, the same democracy, the same kind of, pol uh, the, kind of the, the, the politicking has made um, politicians at least uh, a little more wary of the reform, the next generation of reforms that are needed. Um, 
are we, what are we going to see in the next few years in terms of the effect of politics and the election cycle on, in terms of the economic side, in terms of the reform? Um, and are we likely, are we likely to see um, some effort to, I mean, have we seen establishment, Mehir, maybe you can talk about this. Have we seen enough evidence, whether at the state level or the uh, national level, that good economics, that there's a sense amongst politicians that good economics makes for good politics? Okay, okay, all right. Um, I think that we need to understand carefully what we mean when we say good, good economics here. I would say um, there are reforms that are necessary for um, the Indian economy to grow at 8, 10, 12 percent, which are not considered good politics. And I think that this is... What are those, Mihir, if you could just... Flexibility in land, labor, and capital, primarily. So reform of labor law, um, uh, a genuine marketplace for land. Currently, we do not allow uh, farmers to sell their land. And far more accessible uh, capital, um, a independent bankruptcy. Uh, um, we have a new bankruptcy code, but we do not have the ability to implement it yet. You need a corpus of regulators or, or of bankruptcy specialists who will implement it. So there are a bunch of ways in which you need to create uh, flexible uh, factor markets, without which you can't possibly get a flexible and dynamic economy over the long run. Right? Uh, these are generally considered to be dangerous politically these reforms. I have no idea why. All right, It's not like trade unions can vote anybody out of office anymore. It's not like trade unions were voting in the first place for Mr. Modi. There is a continuing sense that these are not worth putting in. And this is not just at the center, but at various st most state level. Uh, there are some states that have actually moved on this. Um, I think that this is because, frankly, the what we think is good economics, and what most people might think is good economics, is not what uh, Indian politicians led by Narendra Modi think is good economics. They don't believe in, uh, as, as, as the president of the BJP said, I'm not interested in this Western word reform. All right, we will find some Indian way of doing this. And the Indian way of doing this is probably going to be much more like the Southeast Asian way of doing it, which is to try and build giant infrastructure projects, maintain a giant state sector, try and push a couple of sort of local preferences down, uh, down the thing and hope that that works. And it may have worked for Malaysia, all right, but Malaysia wasn't a democracy. You could build uh, massively corrupt infrastructure projects without people uh, slowing it down. We are not like that. So I do not think that we can have any model other than transparency and flexibility. But this is not the economics that Narendra Modi believes in. So for him, good economics is good politics because he thinks good economics is, is building a bullet train. But that's not good economics, and um, he, so he's not implementing it. Let, let me push back a little on the issue of good that good economics is not necessarily good politics. So I'm thinking of this landmark act that the government tried to push through in its first year, which was on land acquisition. Now, it got its nose badly bloodied and that had to withdraw. The rural land could no longer be acquired. And since then, this uh, impression has come around that you can't acquire rural land. Hence, perhaps your conclusion. But if you look closely at the bill, it was really poorly drafted. It had a, a clause in it which said that you need farmers to vote on land acquisition, and at least 80% of the farmers must agree. Fine, I have no problem with that, and you know that's not historically been hard to get, except with eminent domain where the state decides that industrial corridors and public highways are, are involved. Now that one clause, except, created the political context for the Congress party to go and say, this is anti-poor. Now, had this been carefully done, you know, you could have passed this. I mean, we saw it with the general sales tax, which took so many years to get passed and finally got passed a few months ago. The BJP stalled it, stalled it when it was in power, as you all know. Came back with essentially the same bill with some bad clauses on industrial dispute resolution. The Congress said, remove this and we'll get rid of, we'll okay it. And it passed when that was changed. Um, I'm, I don't agree that good politics and good economics are necessarily inconsistent. It's how you work it. Maybe that's the politics of it that's not been properly done. Yeah. So let me just add one point, and I want to take off from this idea of, you know, the, the Modi government was able to pass this new uh, GST law, which, uh, you know, has essentially a harmonized uh, goods and services tax all across the country. It passed parliament unanimously, 
So again, if you compare with our US democratic system, if we tried to pass a law about the time of day is, that wouldn't pass un unanimously here. Okay. Uh, what that's going to do in India is going to substantially increase tax collections over the long haul. Over the short haul, yes, there'll be some ups and downs, but I think that there is enough money to go around for the Indian government for both good economics and good politics. Good economics for India means large transfer payments to the very poor. Okay. But that doesn't, you know, there will be enough money to do that. Good, good economics also means having sound economic policy. And that, I think, will really happen at the state level, where the liberalization of labor and capital, I think, will proceed. The liberalization of land, I think, is a much more complex issue, because the reason land is opaque in India is because the politicians own most of that undocumented land. And passing a land transparency law would mean you know, displaying how much wealth they themselves own. So I don't think that that's going to happen in the next 10 years. But I think labor and capital, definitely there'll be many, many states that will liberalize that just to be able to attract more capital. We are seeing that in Telangana, in Andhra, in Tamil Nadu already, despite all the retail corruption happening in those states. Here, very quickly, you wanted to... Well, just on land, um, I think that uh, while, I mean, both of you are correct in, in many respects, the simple point that I'm making is that you don't need to rely on state acquisition. Um, in a modern economy, and the, one that, the kind of economy that India should create, all you need is an open market for land. And all you need for that to happen is to, is to scrap that one clause that says farmers cannot sell their land to anyone except other farmers. Scrap that land, allow them to volunteer, that law, allow them to voluntarily sell uh, to industrialists, and, you, and, you, and you're almost there. But that has not been done, and there's no interest in doing this because the government still imagines that farmers need to be protected from taking, from being market participants themselves. I might respond to that. The origins of the law go back to independence. When this massive transfer of land in British times had taken place from small farmers to money lenders. And money lenders, and that's why you entered independence with about 40% of the rural population as landless. Today that percentage is over 50%. So from a state rights point of view, it was agreed in the constitution that the issue of agricultural land would be determined by the states, and not by the national government, because they understood the sensitivity of, of, and the political sensitivity also of farmers losing their lands to money lenders. So it was never thought of as a law that would create a transfer of land for outside agriculture into industry. It was a transfer within agriculture that was thought to be protected. The question you're asking is, is that a good thing for this time and day? I would argue it still makes sense. You know, there's immense opportunity in agriculture. What needs to be changed is how can you consolidate agriculture to do well within the agriculture You system. still can't sell to a contract farmer. You still can't sell to no, a large I collective agree. farm. So, Mayor, we're going to, just so that this doesn't turn into a panel on land reform, and I do want to leave time for questions, but I do want to kind of throw out one question to all of you before uh, we do that, which is... Um, going back to that time initially, since kind of Indian independence, um, Indian policymakers, but also um, folks in other countries, have always, um, for different reasons, uh, compared India and China. So following on on the previous panel as well, relative um, to China, what, I mean, if you had to either make the case or not, um, in terms of the Indian economy or kind of the future, the next 10 uh, 15 years. Uh, what are the relative strengths and weaknesses of India vis-a-vis -vis China? Here. Um, I think that the comparison between India and China, even when we were at an equivalent per capita level, was of a level of income, was tremendously misleading. It was tremendously misleading because uh, the Chinese always had a more effective state than the Indian state from day one. All right. However hold and you know they, they were uh, the Chinese were never really colonized through and through they retained their uh, the, the architecture of a supportive state across their own territory for the entire period of European domination not colonization we had a European extractive state put in place which was minimal which was uh, not helpful and not supportive and we haven't changed that so the Chinese state was always better than the Indian state a 
B, even at the point in time when um, the Indians, uh, when Indian and China, uh, uh, India and China per capita income was comparable, before China began its reforms, which were 13 years ahead of India's, um, the Chinese population was better educated, more literate, and had far better health indicators and far better female empowerment indicators than the Indian population. These were not comparable countries at any point in the past thousand years. We were always generations we're behind We're supposed to be looking forward, Meher, so uh, I'm actually we, are, we, we remain generations behind them and right. we are slipping further behind. Gunjan, do you, do you want to add anything on kind of the future? Uh, if, when, if you are telling people where to um, look, are you, uh, how, if you had to make the case of India versus China, what would you do? Or both I was, for that I was very struck by the discussion in the last panel on China where most of the conversation seemed to revolve around uh, the, the uh, grand plan of the Chinese government for its planned economy. Uh, you know, here we are sitting in the most capitalistic country in the world wondering about how the plan is going to go. Okay. India has dismantled the planned economy. India has a free market. India's markets far, are far more similar to the United States. And India is, is encouraging its entrepreneurs in, in the same way that the US does. So I think going forward, you are going to see the Indian economy start to be driven by these entrepreneurs in a very, very positive way. And I think that, that, that's one factor. The second factor is that on the defense and strategic side, which we haven't talked about very much, uh, the US can sell weapons to India. The US wants to align its defense strategy with India. The US needs India, you know, right now, American taxpayers are spending a tremendous amount of money into Pakistan, which has been creating problems. But going forward, the alignment will be much more close with India. So I think we'll see a much better US-India relationship, and I think we'll see India start to move forward much faster. Some would probably argue about how free a market India has and the fact that it still has one of the largest state-owned sectors um, in the world. We're going to turn to questions. We'll, we'll cluster a few. Um, uh, please. Over here, I think we're going to wait for a mic. Um. A compound question, quick compound question on a similar theme. First, will the bang of the GST reform be as big as the hype suggests? Secondly, what is the next big bang reform that comes afterwards? And thirdly, are we, uh, are observers of India missing the big picture when we just focus on big bang reforms and we're not, we're not seeing incremental changes that acquire critical mass. Um, are there other questions? Uh, why don't you, should we start with those? Rafiq, do you want to start? Uh, well, I wanted to bring up a related point, which is that one of the bright spots uh, apparently in India is that the GDP growth rate is high. Uh, it's higher than China, at least on paper. There's some questions about the accuracy of the number, but there are accuracy questions about China's numbers as well. Within that context, if you're looking at um, an economy that's really not doing that well right now, maybe the real growth rate in India is about 4% rather than 7.5%, then it's, it seems to me that a number of reforms are needed. And GST, this general sales tax, reform is just one of a very big number of reforms that are needed. And, and right now, I don't see the political movement on doing things. For example, if you look at trade, I mean, trade in India ought to be a driver of growth, just as it was in China. So Modi has this Make in India platform. But then if you look at the number of clearances, the non-tariff barriers, the inspection regimes, cost of transportation and logistics, those add up to about 30, 40, 50 percent, depending on the sector of the total cost of making. Just the non-tariff barriers exceed those of the tariff barriers in terms of cost. I would say that trade and logistics are key areas for reform that, that ought to be taken up in a, in a hurry, which could have very quick payoffs uh, if done. And there are a number of others I don't want to. Mayor. Okay, first of all, on the GST, um, if, if implemented properly, yes, it's amazing, it's brilliant to live up to the hype. 
but it hasn't been passed. Um, you know, uh, in case you got the impression it's been passed, no. we have passed, and this is, I love, I love India, it's so complicated. We have passed a constitutional amendment enabling the, the drafting and pass, eventual passage of a GST bill, which will then have to be passed by both houses of parliament and by 20 something state legislatures. The actual drafting of that bill will be incredibly confusing um, and incredibly politically complicated. States are still disagreeing upon, upon what will be subsumed into the new GST and what will be not. If it's well drafted, it'll be very good. Okay, that's question one. Question two that you had was, um, what's the next big bang reform on the agenda? None. Uh, the government has very clearly said, this is it, we are done, now we're focusing on welfare until the next elections. So don't even think about reform, don't go to Delhi asking for reform, it's not gonna happen. Third, um, on the question of do little bits of incremental reform add up to big bang reform? No, otherwise they would be called big bang reform. All these little things that, that the government has done over the past few, few years do not fundamentally change or transform the nature of the Indian economy. Do not, they do not make it more open, they do not make it more flexible, they do not make it more efficient. They make the government slightly more uh, responsive, they make, um, uh, uh, make little tweaks to transparency, but they do not make the Indian economy a better market economy, and that's what true reform is about, and they have done nothing on this. Uh, David, very quickly, I, I hope there's no more Big Bang reform, because Big Bang creates uncertainty, Big Bang creates confusion, as you just heard Mihir point out with the GST. It's like the Affordable Care Act, you know, it takes 10 years to pass, and then, then they keep talking about dismantling it, right? So the, uh, it's the little changes that are happening that I think are very important. To me as a business consultant advising American companies going to India, it's the little changes that actually make a difference and that are encouraging American companies to continue to engage in a bigger way in India. I think we've got a question uh, back there and did I, s right back there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, when I talk about India, I describe it as a continent, not a subcontinent, given the variety. And I was wondering if, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about India and, 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 the, and the challenges. Maybe I'd be really curious to hear about interesting state level or municipal level developments that really do show, say, the potential of India, even if it's at a local level. Are there other questions? Um, one over here and one over here, and then we'll go back uh, to the panel for the, the last uh, responses. One over here, right there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Nabe Watanabe, I'm from uh, Japan, uh, working in Tokyo Foundation, and uh, the, I'm very curious, uh, nuclear, civil nuclear business, uh, especially the, between the US and uh, uh, India, and the complicated, because the US uh, nuclear, civil nuclear company owned by a Japanese company, so, um, the, of course, the, the situation is uh, always difficult to, because uh, you know, it's ongoing, it seems to me, but at the same time, uh, many trouble within uh, India, too. And uh, of course, some trouble you mentioned, the Pakistan things, uh, that, that's probably the, some trouble between the nuclear race, uh, between India and, and the Pakistan, but uh, I'm very curious to hear what's going on now. And then one final question right over here at this central table. Uh, thank you. I'd uh, very much like to know, especially from uh, Rafik, so your outlook on the relationship between India and China. Uh, we're also going to have a whole panel um, on India abroad uh, with Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon um, at about 11.30, I think. Uh, but Gunjan, do you want to uh, start us off some interesting uh, municipal or state-level developments um, perhaps, uh, if you want to take that one, we've got a question on the civil uh, state of the civil nuclear uh, industry, uh, and then the final question about India-China. Uh, feel free to pick up on any one of those. Okay, so I, the municipalities in India generally have very little power, so the, the action really is at the state level, and I would say if you look at states, as that I mentioned before, uh, Karnataka, I mean uh, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Maharashtra, Gujarat, perhaps, perhaps Madhya Pradesh, you will see that they are actually moving forward fairly rapidly compared to the rest of the states in the country. And uh, you know, we don't have enough time to go into the specifics, but those are the states that I'm focused on in terms of uh, looking carefully at their, at their um, 
ability to attract foreign investment and their ability to provide a better business climate. Now, let me address the civil nuclear business because Westinghouse was our client uh, when, you know, like two weeks after President Bush signed the civil nuclear agreement. Um, you know, the signing of the civil nuclear agreement marked really a change in the way the U.S.-India strategic and economic relationship works. But not one serious penny has been spent by the government of India towards, you know, Westinghouse or GE just yet. Uh, there's many, many reasons why that's happening. But I think fundamentally, India needs nuclear energy. And fundamentally, even despite the nuclear accident in Japan, India is committed to improving the amount of power produced uh, by atomic uh, means. And they know that their heavy water uh, technology cannot get them there. So absolutely, the Westinghouse projects will happen. They may take a little longer than anybody wants. But I fully expect that, uh, that those will come into play. Mihir. OK, 15 seconds in each. Um, there, are, there are lots of fun uh, state-level experiments going on. Um, aside from the ones that uh, Gunjan has mentioned, may I recommend people have a look at the state of Rajasthan, which borders Delhi, which is basically almost like a laboratory for a lot of the uh, larger reforms that we've been talking about, including flexibility in labor. Um, on the nuclear deal and, and, and progress in nuclear uh, um, purchases and relations. Um, I think that we, that has been one of the big things that has changed under the Modi government. You no longer have the kind of internal opposition within the government to making compromises, uh, making the compromises necessary to uh, implementing the deal that was in, uh, that existed in the previous government. So I think we'll see a lot of uh, a quick forward movement in, in, in the years to come. And on the last point about India and China, um, frankly, I think that China doesn't care very much about India. Um, because we don't count and we're not very large, and we in India worry a lot about China because they do count and they are very large. Um, at some point in the future, uh, this is going to change. Um, I think I'll just go back to Shiv Shankar Menon's uh, um, statement yesterday when he said that both the Indians and the Chinese think that they will dominate the world and dominate the future, and definitely I think most Indians do, um, and this is something that's best left to the future to figure out. Rafiq. Yeah, just quickly, just on the last question on India-China relations, I think the for Indian policymakers, they're trying to balance two things. One is to what extent should they follow along with U.S. initiatives in foreign policy, to the extent that India needs the U.S. as a supplier of technology, a big supplier of foreign investment, and so on. And, that's, and you see that some of that tension showing up in India-China relationships where, for example, the South China Sea or Japan is concerned. The other side is where India on its own has to defend its foreign policy quite independent of US interests. One of the, those areas is it's near abroad. The whole of South Asia is a zone of contention between China and India. That includes Myanmar, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka. And you know, you've been seeing ups and downs in these relationships. But it's a contentious relationship, it's not a cooperative one. Where it comes to trade and economic integration, I think there is the best hope for an improved relationship. But even if you look at China's Belt and Road Initiative, the way it's been designed, India is not a part of it. Okay, it, it hits Chittagong, where this port is being built, then goes down to Hamban Tota, which is now obviously in jeopardy with this, new, with this government, then goes to Mauritius and so on, completely bypasses India. Of course, includes Pakistan as a big component. I think the Chinese also recognize from where Modi is right now, it's not clear where this economic interdependence is going to grow. I think, let's see, as Mihir, I think, correctly pointed out, China's at a completely different stage of the game. Uh, thank you, Rafiq. Please join me in, in thanking our panel. I know we've gone a little over, but um, thank you all. <laughs>